Benny Benack the third. How are you doing? I'm good, man. Things are uh, things are churning along here in New York City, for better or for worse. It seems like we're open and we're uh, we're here for business. So I'm I'm getting busy again. It's it's really been a joy to be back in clubs playing for live audiences. Yeah, I um I've been seeing you. Um, let's see here. You 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 were with uh, uh let's see here. The house, the, the house concert series. Um, let's see here. What is that? Is that the thing with uh, with Emmett, the pianist? Emmett yeah, Cohen? yeah, yeah. Emmett yeah, Cohen. in his in his apartment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up there in uh, in Hamilton Heights, in the Heights. Oh, oh my goodness! I mean, he's he's really. I mean, he's really used this time fruitfully. I mean, he's like turned himself into. I mean, he kind of turned himself into a star. I mean, he was great before, of course, but now everybody, I mean, his, his stream is interesting because he's streaming simultaneously on Facebook and on YouTube. And if you look at the numbers, I mean, he's getting like 800 live viewers on YouTube and 800 live viewers on, right. on Facebook, which is totally incredible because getting 20 live viewers is like a lot. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, so doing that and especially doing it with jazz is like quite incredible. Yeah. It was really something, uh, you know, something to see develop over the last year and a half where, you know, it almost started just by happenstance because in New York at the time they started, it had, it had only been a week or two into the like, you know, lockdown in New York, basically, where they were saying only interact with people in your social bubble, don't go outside to buy groceries, don't do anything. And just by fate, Emmett, Russell Hall, the bassist and Kyle Poole, the drummer, they all live within like a block of each other. So mm -hmm. they essentially were, you know, in each other's, you know, social bubble for the entirety of, of this thing. And, you know, I live another 15 blocks down the street. So I was, you know, the one that was, uh, you know, making the long journey 15 blocks up if they needed me to go there and help set up a camera, but it definitely had humble beginnings. You know, if you go back there and look at one of the first episodes, it was just like the camera on the MacBook, you know, and, and yep. very DIY. And then, you know, as, as it developed now, it's a point where I was there last week, he had Nicholas Payton come in and the entire apartment is like a recording studio. I mean, he's got two guys full time working the cameras, working the audio. There's lighting, mm -hmm. there's multi multi cams. I mean, it's like he's like running a, a TV show once a week now. And it's crazy to think back, you know, all it was when we started was just, you know, Emmett and Russell and Kyle just trying to get together and play to keep their sanity, let alone have, you know, 1500 people listen to him do it. Yeah, it's really incredible. Uh, yeah, and the the uh, uh, the camera uh, the camera switching now, and you know, chopping up the videos and releasing them as you know, you know, <laughs> singles. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Uh, you know, from the concerts, all of that kind of stuff is just really great. Uh, it's great business, and it is. It's a rec it's a recognition. Um, it's the acknowledgement of a problem, but then using uh, the the current technology and the fact that uh, folks are sort of sequestered, you know, as an advantage. You know, because because uh, I can't think of a scenario where uh, that show becomes that <laughs> that popular in that short a period of time except for the pandemic yeah absolutely so, you talk about a you know the, the the term a captive audience i mean you know that was quite <laughs> literally a captive audience i mean people were locked inside they had nothing else to do and back when it started you know there there were there were definitely rumblings in those early weeks where for every 10 comments you'd have of people saying how much life and joy it was giving them 
there would be another one or two people they were being well why don't they have masks on why are they sharing this microphone why are they why are they in a room together they they, they should not be socializing at all so not not to say that it was a calculated risk because you know they were adhering to protocols they were you know in the same circle but you know i think part of the reason that it became such a success is that it was really the first the first of its kind you know by the time all of the clubs got their cameras and their sound people together and they were doing live streams and then everybody like me we bought our little interface and we got our microphone you know everybody was late to the party by the time the rest of the world caught up like you said you'd be lucky to have 20 people watch but because emmett started it so early you know he was like the first one so he really kind of just captured the attention of people right from jump street and then that audience you know they, they were loyal and i think the question was as things started to open up and, and got cats got busy and you know emmett especially started to travel and tour you know and there were just more reasons for people to go outside would people still watch live streams and i think the interesting thing that we've all noticed not just with emmett's but especially with a lot of the jazz clubs that added streaming to their you know, to their performances as well. I think it's not like all or nothing where if it's a pandemic, everybody's sitting there watching. And if it's an open season, then everyone's doing other things. The streaming, I think, is really here to stay. And there still are going to be a lot of people that will set their watch to go watch a streaming concert, um, even if the world is open and they have other things they could do and they could go outside. So like you said, I think this was kind of a very harrowing situation for, for all of us in the artistic world and performers. But out of that, you know, this technology was streaming now. It's, it's here to stay. And it could possibly be, you know, an additional income revenue for clubs and an additional way for musicians to reach a wider audience. So, you know, we, we really have made technology our, our friend here in the last year and a half. Yeah, you know... Um... So, you know, I'm not I'm not getting uh, sixteen hundred live viewers <laughs> for my for my concerts, but I uh, I've been doing a once a month thing since uh... oh, okay. So I guess I've been doing it for about a year now. Yeah, there you uh, go. So since nice. uh, August of of last year, and. Uh, and you know, it started out, I was at, we were at a venue, um, and, uh, it's kind of a tragic thing. Uh, David Strauss, uh, rest in peace. Um, wasn't an old guy. Uh, and, uh, he, he was like a, the jazz benefactor or something, you know, Oh wow. uh, where, where I live in Columbus, uh, Columbus, Ohio. And he, uh, he owned you know, a bunch of property and stuff. It was a wealthy guy and he renovated, you know, one of these buildings. It was a mansion, an old mansion that had been, uh, let's see here. It had been, uh, you know, they, they say, okay, this, what is it? The historical society, you know, dubs the building and say, okay, now you can't tear it down. Right. Okay. All right. Landmark so then he renovated the, yeah, he renovated this thing and he turns it into a jazz club. It was called the Blue Velvet Room. And so I played there for uh what was it, 3 or 4 months uh with the once a you know uh once a month thing and this guy was I mean, there was like hardly any audience. Um, you know, everybody's wearing masks, but hardly any audience. Everything was live streamed and he was just like going to the ATM machine and just like paying the guys out of his own pocket um and he was paying guys pretty well for what the gig was it was like a two-hour gig um and uh so we did that and then uh and that stuff was live streamed and then uh i was just my band was displaced for a couple months which was around christmas time so like the month before christmas and for christmas we just live streamed out of my office um, at Ohio State, where I, where I work, I just live stream right at my office, um, uh, and you know, made some tips and things. Uh, my YouTube channel has been monetized for some time, so 
so I could get like super chats and stuff like that. And, and then also, you know, the same. Th Thank you so much for watching my video so far. If you'd like to support, there are several ways to do so below. Also, likes are free. Please comment, share, and subscribe. Now back to the video. The same th stuff that everyone else is doing, Cash App and Venmo and yeah. PayPal, whatever it is, you put the stuff out there and sometimes folks uh, support. Now one thing happened, which was interesting because this, was, this was, would have been December. Um, so we did, uh, we recorded, in my office we recorded uh, for a party that we had done like every year for several years. And they were like, Hey, you know, we still want, you know, you to do the music. And I had forgotten that I had written on the board behind me, Venmo cash app, PayPal. Okay. So, so that was a pre-record. So then we do our live thing. Okay. We do the pre-record then like days later, my phone is blowing up. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? I don't understand what's happening. People read that stuff off the board and they were Man. donating like crazy. Wow. You know, and you know, that, that told me, that told me something about, um, people's love and s support of the arts, even if sometimes we don't feel it. Um, it told me about people's generosity, people, uh, actually really feeling, uh, you know, the struggle of artists, people that are, you know, it's like, what are you going to do? You can't get people in a room, you know? And so that, that, uh, spoke volumes. So then since then I've been in the same place, which is, the, it's a place called blue note jazz cafe. And we stream live every, every weekend. I'll tell you often it's the case that, uh, at least half of the bread that we're collecting from the gig is it's from tips. It's from Donation. people that are yeah. tuning in and they, and they're donating, donating. So, um, that's definitely going to stay in there. <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely be live streaming. Uh, even if, yeah, um, man, you know, I mean, it's just, I think it's, it's the thing to do. I mean, we know that all of the same gigs, these gigs have been paying the same forever, <laughs> you know? Right. And so you got to find some kind of way to make it, to make it work financially. And I don't know, you know, um, th with as inexpensive, um, as the, uh, you know, a lot of really, you know, good quality streaming stuff is now. I think that, I, I think that's the solution. So I totally agree. I think the streaming thing is, is here to stay. Yeah, man. I got to come check out that, uh, that club. It's fairly new, right? The blue, blue note cafe or in the yeah, last few blue years, note right? I've heard yeah. good things from, from, from the cats coming out of Columbus. So I, I got to make, make that one of my pit stops next time I'm home in Pittsburgh. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. And, um, you know, I, the, I, I have some, um, you know, I have some, some things going on in my head about, uh, you know, getting you, uh, to Columbus sometime. We'll, we'll, we'll be, we'll be talking about that. Yeah, man. Heck yeah. Yeah. All right. And, uh, you know, and another thing that started right when the pandemic started for me is this interview series. So this is, uh, what is this? I think this is episode 150. It's 157 or 158. Wow. Yeah. And uh, it started, I started uh, the end of March and that's the, um, you know, the, the much fabled um, doomsday March, right. <laughs> you know, right, when everything, right, right. when of the course. bottom of the world fell out yeah, yeah um <laughs> it is interesting man how how things transition and change this pandemic has turned me into <laughs> some sort of uh you know, what is it a social media influencer <laughs> i don't know what's going on man <laughs> well it's like you say man you just gotta make uh make lem life gives you lemons and make lemonade and uh you know, that's definitely something where those that adapt survive, you know, and we've seen it. I've seen it with a lot of musicians of, of all ages and all generations, you know, the ones that were more kind of willing to jump headfirst into all of the social media and all of the, you know, online content and streaming and all of that. 
you know, those are the ones that it's kind of like the squeaky wheel gets the oil, you know? So if you're, yep. if you're, tr you know, trying to, to reach people and, and using all of these tools at your disposal, it's going to, it's going to bear fruit. I, I really believe that. Yeah, definitely. All right. So, so we met, uh, uh, when you were a guest artist, uh, with the Columbus jazz orchestra. And, uh, you know, I frequently play with that band and, uh, you know, I was on for that, that series and, uh, I thought you put a great, put on a great show, uh, not just playing the horn, but, uh, singing, you know, doing the whole, doing the whole thing, man. Um, and, uh, I knew that at that point, you know, you know, I wanted to try to reach out to you for something, but, you know, uh, you know, then the pandemic happened and everything and it's, uh, taken this long for us to reconnect, but, um, you know, thanks for, uh, you know, thanks for doing, doing the interview. Of course, man. I'm, I'm glad that, uh, we could all stay in touch. You know, one of the, one of the big bummers for me, you know, everybody, every one of our friends, every musician has their sob stories from last year of like which amazing opportunity or which awesome gig they had canceled. Right. And one of the ones I was looking forward to the most was to do the Columbus Zoo, you know, way back in whatever it yep. was, yep. July or August or something of, of, of 2020. I was going to come back out and do something with the CJO. And, you know, that was a bummer. So I, I've, I've definitely had it on my list to reconnect with all y'all. And I, in, since the time that I was there for that uh, Valentine's Day show in, in 19, I think it was, of course, uh, Pittsburgh had the announcement that Byron Stripling was going to be right. working with their Pops Orchestra, too. So obviously, just having had that experience with you guys at Columbus, I was like telling everybody I could in Pittsburgh, I was like, do you guys realize like what a coup this is that we got Byron to work with the pops? Like he's so incredible. He's an entertainer. He's, you know, so wonderful oh, yeah. at connecting with audiences. He's an incredible artist. Like I I'm excited, you know, for, for my hometown too, for Pittsburgh to see what they can finally do. I believe they just had a concert with Tony Desaire, the pianist and vocalist. They did some kind of yeah. Sinatra thing maybe last week or whatever. So mm. It's nice to see some of these larger ensembles, you know, Winton and Lincoln Center. They just finished up a tour. So it's nice that, uh, you know, some of these large ensembles are able to kind of start getting the wheels churning again. We hope that we can keep the momentum going, you know. Yeah. It, um, and I interviewed all three of those, uh, Winton, uh, <laughs> Tony Sayre, and, and, and Byron, of course. Byron was uh he was one of the first 10 interviews um and you know byron is so uh uh i brought him in over at uh, you know i'm the director of jazz studies at ohio of state and uh i i brought him in um to teach trumpet um which you know is like he, he's he's such a he's such a great musician yeah um and i owe that guy uh quite a bit um he got me to gig uh, you know, got me a gig playing with the Basie band. First, it was just wow. as a sub. And then I've done a couple tours with them. Um, and uh, so that's been very cool. Of course, he played with that, that, that band uh, long for years. Time, yeah. Yeah. But uh, he's such a, such a generous dude. Uh, um, and he has a lot of stories. Um, he, he's got, he's got a lot of stories, always, always good stuff. Uh, I remember I was having, uh, some, some issues with sleeping. Uh, I was going through it, this really, really, really strange, really strange situation. So I, uh, I was finishing up my doctorate and I, which I finished in 19 and I, <laughs> went in for the oral comprehensive and business. I, I did it. I come out and they say, Hey, congratulations. You passed and like this. And the night before that I couldn't sleep, but that makes sense because it's, you know, it's kind of stressful. That's a big day. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's understandable. Um, but what didn't make sense is that some kind of way, my fight or flight sort of instinct just got stuck on. And so 
I couldn't sleep for about two months straight. Oh my gosh, man. Wow. And when I say that I couldn't sleep, I mean, like there was no sleeping happening. Like, I mean, during the day I would like start dozing off and stuff because I was so exhausted. But as far as like overnight trying to sleep, I, there was no sleep happening. Oh my gosh. And I can't was, imagine. Yeah, it was, it was, it, it was, it was pretty dark. It was, it, I, I, I would describe it as being the worst experience I've ever had. Um, I can't because can imagine. It was, yeah. Yeah. So it was like an anxiety thing that was coupled with panic attacks and then the insomnia and it just kept itself going. And eventually I got out of that, but part of what got me out of it was, or some conversations I had with Byron, um, because I was doing, uh, the former student, at, one of my former students from Ohio state, uh, Lucas Holmes, shout out to him. Nice. Um, he's a musical director for what is it? Momentum, uh, and they were doing a, uh, uh, let's see here, a Harlem Renaissance program. Okay. And so, uh, Byron was playing trumpet and singing and I was playing, you know, sax, clarinet, whatever else was in that book. And, and then there was some other guys in the section. I was sitting next to Byron and I was like dozing off and stuff in, in during rehearsals. Because and and so we started talking about it, and he had expressed to me he had some challenges with sleeping, and he gave me some suggestions. And uh, you know, I tried some of those things, and I the, ended up going to some counseling and stuff, and got some things sorted out, and then uh, finally regained uh, the ability to sleep. Uh, it, in my life, I've never had to. Uh, I've never needed to have a. Uh, a routine to go to sleep, you know, never had to have like a, you know, a particular process, but I have a really specific process that I go through each night and it's not a long process. Uh, it's not like, you know, 40 minutes or something. It's, it's, it's actually pretty short, but it's the same thing every time. And that is, that's really helped. And I also had some, some, I have some family history that I didn't consider that, um, may have been, uh, part of the issue. Other folks in my family that have dealt with some anxiety things, mm. but, um, but anyhow, but he was, uh, uh, particularly helpful and even just having a conversation. Cause sometimes like if you're going through something like that, you feel like you're alone, like everybody else is sleeping. Everybody else right, seems like they're right, doing fine, but right. you're like the only one that's not sleeping. And so just having conversation with folks was uh was was helpful um but um so so you say you're from pittsburgh so talk talk about your your upbringing and uh what you what got you into music maybe some early mentors um and when you knew that uh you had been uh bit by the music bug and uh there was no no uh changing course yeah, well, I, I actually, it's funny because I just came from home um, yesterday. I flew back. So I was, in, I was in Pittsburgh Friday and Saturday playing a couple gigs. And, and as is often the case, when I go home to Pittsburgh to perform, I play alongside my parents. So my dad, who actually came when we did those concerts um, in Columbus, both my parents came. My dad even came when they had that like jam session in the lobby, you know, after the second show and he brought his horn and he came and sat in. And uh, my mom is a vocalist and a voice teacher at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, a professor. So the bug caught me, you know, basically right out of the gate. And I was surrounded by music, you know, in the car, in the house, everywhere. It was just such a part woven into the fabric of my life. And it was always something that brought me so much joy. And uh, I was very grateful that my parents, you know, because obviously at the time I was very young, I had a, you know, a high aptitude for it. I had a lot of natural ability and they kind of fostered that without, without pushing, you know, because uh, having gone to, I mean, you know, you're, you're the head of a, of a, of a jazz program. You probably see the full gambit where, everybody's background and the way they find the music is different. Some people like me grew up with it 
and are, you know, scatting along with Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong when they're five without even knowing what they're doing. And then you have some students that are in a jazz conservatory that, you know, maybe they started playing acoustic bass their junior year. You know, they were like a rock bass player before that. Or maybe, you know, they were a guitar player and then they picked up trumpet senior year and all of a sudden it took and it took then and they decided they want to play trumpet, you know. So I feel very grateful that I kind of had this head start where, you know, I was able to dive into the music and take it really seriously from the time that I was even super young as a teenager. But I was also thankful my parents never made it feel like it was being forced on me. You know, if I wanted to go mm. play basketball, even though I was a very mediocre athlete, they would drive me to basketball practice. And if I wanted to, you know, do the musical, they let me do the musical. If I wanted to be in chess club, I could be in chess club. And certainly there, they were there for advice and for guidance when it, the topic of music and, you know, the, that business side came up. But I never felt like my parents were like stage parents, you know, or, or, or helicopter parents. You know, they were just very supportive and um, it allowed me to kind of find my path with the music on my own. And, uh, you know, I knew from a very early on that I wanted to go to music school. I wanted to move to New York and, and I wanted to play jazz. And I was fortunate to have a lot of mentors growing up. But one thing that in particular just seemed so serendipitous to me, you know, it seemed like somebody had to put this in the stars was to place Sean Jones in my lap in Pittsburgh at the most influential time in my life. You know, I was like in seventh grade, something like that, junior high school. And I attended the Duquesne University summer jazz camp. Mike Tamaro, wonderful, runs the program at Duquesne, wonderful arranger and saxophonist himself. Um, he ran the camp and Sean at that time, was on faculty. He was the trumpet professor at the Duquesne Jazz Department. And, you know, it was a sweet deal for him because at that time he was also playing lead with Lincoln Center. He already had just put out his first record with Mac Av. So he was well on the path of, you know, superstardom as a trumpet soloist, as an artist. Uh, and then he just kind of somewhat randomly had this, you know, sweet teaching gig in Pittsburgh where he didn't have to be there all the time and he could come in and do his lessons. And, um, you know, I just became his shadow. I met him at that camp in the summer and whenever he was in town, wherever he played, I was there, you know, I tried to sound like him every note that I played and he really got me on the path. He told me which summer programs to go out for, which things to, which competitions to audition for, which Woody Shaw solos to listen to, you know, it was yeah. definitely, uh, a, a huge, huge big brother mentor figure for me and um, really kind of got me whipped into shape for when it came time to move to New York and go to college for jazz. And I wasn't such a deer in headlights because he already kind of had, you know, put me through the ringer before I got there. So really? eternally grateful to him. <clears throat> and once I got to New York, of course, there's no short of, it, of inspiration there. And I would say my second great kind of teacher and mentor was the late great Lori Frank, who was a brass pedagogue and, and kind of, uh, you know, the, the brass whisperer, so to speak. She was kind of this, this mythical guru for brass players for their chops. She didn't really improvise, yet all of the jazz majors studied with her, even though she wasn't a jazz teacher. And you would hear rumors of like, oh, Lori Frank she got Ambrose's chops together. When Ambrose, Ambrose Akinmuser came to MSM, he couldn't even play above the staff. And Lori Frank got him together. Now he plays all over the horn. And Nicholas Payton took from Lori Frank. And Freddie Hubbard wanted Lori Frank to fix his chops. And, you know, she was going to do it. And he didn't show up. And, you know, you hear all these myths about this guru. And, uh, you know, she really was like that for me. And so between her and Sean, you know, they kind of really showed me the way with the discipline that is required to really, you know, go to war with an instrument like the trumpet every single day. And uh, very grateful to both of them. And, you know, being in New York, I kind of just as smoothly or unsmoothly as the freelance life can be, you know, I, I went from being a student in New York to being a working professional and, uh, you know, just keep, keep waiting for the phone to ring and going out and hanging and trying to play anywhere I can. And, you know, pay this crazy rent here in New York and so far, so good, <laughs> you know, so far, so yeah. good. 
So, so when I interview uh, Sean Jones, uh, I think it's going to be before the first of the year. No, I, I'm only right. booked through d- December. So, yeah. War in Ohio, I'll, man, representing your state. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll de- I, I will definitely, I'll definitely mention you. Of course, man. You now when when. <laughs> Uh, when you talk about the trumpet and the uh, just the imposing and physical nature of the instrument, um, I know that to be true. I know you noticed that I had a trumpet sitting there. Hey man, I'm I, I can see it. You you got like 1080 quality video. I can see that trumpet <laughs> crystal clear. <laughs> I know you saw that, and uh, that trumpet was given to me that that's uh dwight adams oh man bad dude right there yes uh dwight has been um a friend for a lot of years and has been a mentor has been yeah for a lot of years um i mean we work we he, he taught me everything i know about bodybuilding he taught me you know you know um diminished patterns some diminished patterns and yeah, my other buddy i uh, of course i interviewed dwight i also interviewed vincent chandler the great trombonist um and uh vincent taught me the diminished scale i always I always bring that up when i when i uh when i talked to him he, he brought me up and it was interesting because when he taught it to me i was playing things that apparently suggested to him that i knew the scale but i didn't actually know the scale you didn't know what you were playing <laughs> i didn't know what I was. but playing. it was in there <laughs> it was in there but i didn't i didn't know what i was playing so he 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 he, he, he was like okay here here check it out here's the scale and then of course it's like once you really know something then everything you know it just it does that extra thing to your playing you know yeah. um and this mute right here so I don't know. You probably let's see if we can. I don't is, know if you can make out the signature. B B S is that, is that the initials? Byron Stripling. No, no. Bria. Bria Skomberg. There you go. The other yeah. great B B S initialed trumpeter. There you go. <laughs> Love Bria. She's 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 awesome. Yeah, and um, I met her the same way I met you. Actually, she came to play with. Um, uh, the Columbus Jazz Orchestra, and this was one of the last gigs before everything broke down. Because let's see, that gig was in yeah, that's that's right. It was in February. Okay, yeah, it was yeah, it was it was in right February, before. right before, and and um, you know she she's so um, she's a nice lady. Yeah, man, totally. <laughs> and very, and, and very uh, genuine and everything. I, I was playing. Uh, I I did a. Uh, so I was working at a church where I was the minister of music there. Uh, it was a missionary Baptist church. And, uh, I had this idea for Black History Month, which was to present the entire. <laughs> <laughs> the entire a love supreme su- suite in the service uninterrupted like beginning to end and so i restructured the service so that i could do that and i did a coltrane presentation before the service started uh the pastor there was very very uh supportive of that and which was which which was very cool and uh so i did that whole thing and brought the it was uh the the Ohio Jazz Tech, which is the faculty, uh, the jazz faculty from Ohio State, and we played that whole thing. We it was about twenty six minutes, so a little shorter than the than the recording, but played that whole thing, and uh, she came she came to the church <laughs> church service. Nice, I told her man. at the at the concert. I said, hey, you know, I'm doing this thing over at church. If you want to come check it out, and she showed up. Yeah, that's so, awesome. 
I think the first time I listened to a Love Supreme, it could definitely be classified as a religious experience. So absolutely, I I, uh, I, I see what you were, what you were thinking there. That that I'm sure that was beautiful. Well, if, if you think of the names of the movements too, one of the names of the movements is Psalm. Yeah, you know, uh, acknowledgement. You know, so you, you the a church setting is it really is the native habitat uh, of that of that piece of music of that suite. Um, he definitely was thinking that way. And if you look at some of his other, his other music, like he, I mean, he's got the song for the, with the father, father, the son and the Holy spirit. Right. Um, he's, he's got, uh, um, uh, what is that song? Song of the underground railroad. Um, I mean, it's just all of these songs yeah. that have that sort of spiritual, uh, kind of, kind of thing to them. So, so anyhow, that was that was very cool. So, um, so you moved to New York. Um, was it everything that you had hoped it would be? And what were some of the sort of maybe bumps along the way, maybe opportunities along the way that sort of changed, you know, things? Yeah, I mean, I would say New York is definitely as advertised. Um, and now, you know, having been in New York since 2009, being 30 years old, having the benefit of sort of graduating from, you know, the youngest cat in the room to still generally, you know, one of the younger cats. But there is another generation, certainly, of, of you know, bushy-tailed, bright-eyed young musicians that are coming to New York whether for school or they just graduate and they come here or they're coming from Europe or, or anywhere around the world. Um, and it is really cool, you know, because I lead a few jam sessions now around the city and seeing that experience, the look on these kids' faces for the first time when they get to New York and they walk into the room and they feel the energy, you know, of that jam session. But not only that, you know, you can't really put a put a price on being in the same space as your heroes and, and, you know, being, seeing these people up close and, you know, part of the appeal for me was that in New York city, you know, you're going to be rubbing elbows with, with the giants, with your heroes night after night. And mm. I can remember so many times in my undergraduate, you know, 18, 19 years old, and somebody was playing a midnight show down in the West village. And I had like a, you know, 8 AM jazz history class the next morning. And, you know, Roy Hargrove is playing down at small. Somebody sends me a text message. It's two in the morning. They said, Roy just showed up. He's playing. Is that so Duke Pearson? Like he's at smalls right now. Like you got to get down here. You know, I'm in a practice room, 24 hour practice room in the dorms up by up in, uh, you know, West Harlem, basically. And, you know, hopping on the train, getting down to the village, two 30 in the morning. There's Roy Hargrove. He's there. He's teaching everybody a tune. He's playing flugelhorn. He's playing piano. I mean, that was like a masterclass. That was like, you know, that was school basically. And going down there, doing that, staying out till four in the morning, waiting for the train to come back, going, getting pizza. <laughs> now, all of a sudden the sun's coming up. It's almost six in the morning and I've got class in two hours, you know? And when I look back, I can't think of a better training for the life of a, of a freelance jazz <laughs> right. musician than right. that. The amount of times that I've had to wake up and be somewhere, you know, on no sleep is like, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, you know, professional training unintentionally, but yeah, that you know, reminds me, of, that reminds me of this uh, two week tour I did with the Basie band and we, the, the it, was, it was a European tour yeah. and it was, that band works every day that they're out. I think we had one day off. Wow. So what that means is that you go back to your room after the gig is over. Sometimes you can lay down for about two hours. Then you got to get up, pack, <laughs> and, you know, head to the yeah, airport. Man. So a lot there. of that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, it's, it's like I said, you can't really put a price on it. And, you know, mm. that's, that's, part of the the allure of new york is that you know these these cats are out here every night and no. you know it, actually that it, it's kind of a blessing and a curse because you know as i was going through the gambit of figuring out which schools to audition for it you know i think so many young students they kind of 
get up and they build up in their head and they say, oh, New York City, I have to be in New York right now. I got to be, I got to be at Smalls. I got to be at Dizzy's Club. I got to go to Juilliard or I got to go to Manhattan School or, you know, maybe, maybe I go to New School or, or Purchase or something. But I mean, I have to be in New York. And, you know, there's kind of this, it, it, I mean, I was guilty of it too. At 18 years old, everything I had ever thought I wanted was that Juilliard had just started their jazz program a couple of years prior. And I wanted to go to Juilliard so bad, you know, and what I quickly realized and, and what a lot of those professors later told me too, is that, you know, New York is not going anywhere. These jam sessions, the, the kind of heartbeat of the scene, like it is, no young person should be in a rush to get there. And in a lot of cases, for a lot of young musicians, you know, first impressions are really, really, really impactful, right? So it's almost like if you go out to these jam sessions and you kind of like turn over the, you know, the hourglass, now the clock is running. And now you're at Smalls, you're up on stage, you're standing next to Roy Hargrove. Nobody is going to say, oh, wow, you know, his, his solo was really good there for what is he about a freshman or a sophomore? Yeah. He sounds really good for an 18 year old. It's like, no, you're on stage at a professional setting with professionals. And now you're in the same pile as Roy Hargrove and Jeremy Pelt and whoever else shows up that night. So, you know, for a lot of students, they're probably best suited to like run in the opposite direction from New York city and find a practice room somewhere else and just practice your butt off for four years if your ultimate goal is to then throw yourself into that pool it's almost like why would you why would you want to jump in before you're ready you know it's like uh it's like drafting someone right out of high school and and you know having them go straight to the league instead of having them play you know in the d league or it's like having a, a minor leaguer go from single a to the majors like if you're 18 19 years old there's nothing wrong with just practicing, you know, and taking some time. And then when you graduate, you're 21. If you still want to go to New York, like Smalls is going to be there, you know, all these people are going to mm. be there. So I definitely grappled with the balance of wanting to be out in that scene every night, but still having to show up for the 8 a.m. class, still having to, you know, do my humanities courses and, you know, still practice my instrument. Because when you're, when you're a young student of the music, it's nice to have gigs. It's nice to be out there hanging and feel like you're making inroads in the community, but really your number one priority should just be getting better on your instrument, you know? And fin right. And, and doing your academic work to fin of finish course. your degree. Right, right, right. And you know, that's, that's, uh, th thank you for saying that I'll, I'll pay you later. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> When, when, when I was in, when I, in particular with my undergraduate degree, yeah. but when I was working on that degree and I went to Western Michigan university, um, you know, good program, but you know, it wasn't New York, wasn't New York. Sure. So there weren't the kind of distractions, I think, um, uh, that you probably had, um, but there was still, a, uh, for a small town, there was a lot of gigging opportunities. Yeah. And so I did as many gigs and things as I could um, while still trying to prioritize uh, my degree. But something happened frequently. And and at times it was, it was quite tempting. Um, we had a lot of, uh, you know, big artists come through. Um, for uh, jazz festivals to play with the big band or to come and do master classes and stuff. And they'd hear me play and often was the case that they offered me a gig. There you go. What, what the, the problem was is the gig was like, Hey, move to New York. Um, here's, here's a, you know, X, Y, and Z. And, you know, I'm like a sophomore or something. And I'm like, well, I need to, I need to finish my degree because the, the thing is, is as you get older, you're going to have less opportunities for people to pay for your education. Right. Absolutely. So, so if I'm 35 and I'm like, Hey, yeah, man, I need some scholarship money. That's not the same is I'm 18. Right. I'm out of high school. Right. 
do you have some scholarship money for me? Um, it's just a different, it's a different kind of thing. And now that exact opportunity that I had to say no to, that won't reoccur, but those opportunities will reoccur. You, you will have those opportunities and you don't have to be in a rush. You can get your stuff together. And uh, another, another thing I think, uh, I think that, um, very often we don't consider, uh, as much is it's not just about being able to do the gig. It's about being able to balance everything to sustain a career of doing gigs. That's a different, that's a different thing. Yeah. And if you don't have that maturity, that sort of infrastructure developed, the discipline developed, the professionalism, you know, together, all of that stuff. If you don't have all of that stuff together, you show up in the wrong way. And it's like you said, first impressions are a big deal. I mean, look, look, okay. I, um, you know, and I look, I'm, I'm a forgiving cat. Um, you know, I, I believe that people, you know, deserve a second shot, sure. you know, all of that stuff, you know, that that's great. And, and I will do that as much as I can. <sighs> but if the last experience that I had with you, even if it was with you 10 years ago, you know, even when you were still in college, whatever it was, whatever that experience I had, I cannot afford right. to take the risk. I, I, I can't risk because when you make a recommendation, <laughs> then what happens is if this dude comes, you know, shows up and craps all over <laughs> everything, then now it's like my word doesn't mean anything and you can't take that risk right so you you kind of have to like before you try to put yourself out there on front street you really need to have the stuff together yeah man yeah and i i had experiences too like you we were talking about similar to your situation where you know i was about to finish my undergrad and my master's you know i was go planning on going back to manhattan school the following fall the following semester <laughs> And there was already kind of an understanding. Again, I was very fortunate that I one of the programs I did in high school was the at the time Gibson Baldwin sponsored the what was called the Grammy Band, and it used to be the McDonald's All American program. So it was just this kind of national honors jazz band, basically. And at the time that I did it, the head of the band, you know, the conductor of the band was Justin DeChocho, who ran the program at Manhattan School of Music. So I did it as a junior, and then I did it again as a senior, and couple of my buddies that had graduated and were there, you know, they kind of told me what I had to do to kind of, you know, have a conversation with Justin and, and give interest that I wanted to go to the school. And as, as all the dominoes fell, it ended up, I, I was on scholarship for my undergrad, which was, you know, amazing because it's already a tough, tough gig living in New York city, trying to pay the rent as a musician. I can't imagine doing it with, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of debt. So I finished, you know, I was about to finish the undergrad. There was a kind of an understanding between Justin and I that I was going to come back for my master's and they were going to take care of me. So again, like you're saying, what a tremendous opportunity to have six years and two degrees of school completely paid for. I mean, looking back on it, it is just like such an incredible, you know, blessing that I had. And of course me, you know, 20 years old, about to finish so I had met Ulysses Owens Jr., the drummer who actually produced and played drums on my last album that came out right before the pandemic, A Lot of Living to Do with Christian McBride. And Ulysses and I, we met at a jam session at Jazz Lincoln Center, Dizzy's Club. I was doing all the right things. You know, we met at the jam. I introduced myself, gave him my card. You know, we played a jam. We played a, a session together, you know. And I got this call from Ulysses at that time, jazz and Lincoln center had just built a club in Doha in Qatar. And they basically took Dizzy's club and just copy and pasted it into a St. Regis hotel in Doha. And they were bringing bands out there for a month at a time. And Ulysses 
gave me the call. You know, it was about April or May or something of my senior year. And he said, man, we're going out. We're going out to Doha for a month. The band's me, you, Tim Green, incredible alto saxophone player from Baltimore. Um, Yasushi Nakamura, like one of the most working Mm. bass players in New York City. You know, these are all guys 10 years, 15 years older than me. And I was like, this is it. You know, this is my Willy Wonka golden ticket, my big break. And (laughs) in order for me to go and do that gig, I was going to have to miss the final big band concert of my senior year and the big band concert, you know, just the show show, they programmed a couple Sinatra charts, you know, we were going to do a concert for all the donors or something. So, you know, from the school's perspective, from the Chocho's perspective, I'm on full scholarship. That means, you know, if they put me in rotation for a concert, I'm going to be there, you know, especially if they're doing Sinatra charts for me to sing, you know, for the president of the school and all the donors. So I walked into his office and I was like, hey, um, Justin, so I, Ulysses Owens asked me to go to Doha. It's with Lincoln Center, and I just, I really have to do it. And, you know, he kind of listened, and he let me talk, and then he was kind of like, well, you know, you have a decision to make, and, you know, if 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 you want to miss this concert and you want to go do do that gig, you know, that's, that's your right. Um, and in so many words, he basically told me that if I took that gig, I would be, you know, wise to look elsewhere for my higher education for the next degree so you know i went back i talked to sean about it actually i talked to my parents and thankfully i had the right people around me that just said what you said that were like look yeah this is a tremendous opportunity but what else is a tremendous opportunity is getting a free education and you know these opportunities these gigs if you're putting yourself in the right position they will come around again. It might not be exactly Doha with Ulysses Owens, but something of that ilk will come back. Don't be an idiot. Stay in school. And lo and behold, Ulysses understood. I went back to Manhattan school. I finished my master's a couple years later. And then the summer after I finished my master's, I had just moved into my first apartment out of the dorms with my buddy, the roommate. That summer, Ulysses called me and said, I am starting a band. We've got a Japanese record label. We're going to do a three-week tour all over Japan. We're going to do a record date. Do you want to be in the band? And it was almost all the same cats of that gig in Doha. And that ended up being a band called the New Century Jazz Quintet. We recorded four albums. We toured all over Japan. And now we still go there every summer and teach uh, a workshop. Seiko, the watch company, sponsors a jazz workshop in Tokyo. Huh. And so, you know, I've been going to Japan here now for, for almost a decade on the heels of that opportunity. But it's like you said, it's hard to tell a young person, you know, in the moment, you you know, when your life is only this long, you know, and you get an opportunity like that, you only see this far in front of you, you know, you don't have the benefit of the kind of wider zoomed out view that hopefully Mm -hmm. your mentors and teachers and, and family are trying to impart on you. So I had the right people talk some sense into me. I stayed in school. And then once I graduated, you know, because I was doing all the right things, opportunities like that ended up, you know, availing themselves again. So I, I definitely feel like I made the right call. And, you know, I have some buddies that were in the same shoes and they left school and they took the gig and they said they were going to go back the next semester. But what always happens once you get out of school it's hard to put it back in the box. And all of a sudden now there's another gig. So you're going to have to wait another That's semester right. and then, Oh, well maybe I'll just go back next year, you know, and then you've got, you know, parents that are, that have a empty place on the wall that they're waiting for this plaque, you know, yep. for their, for their son or daughter to finish school. And the cat's like, Oh, I just want a gig, man. I just want to play gigs, but it's nice. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You're, you're uh, you know, a co- collegiate faculty member like yourself, but you know, it's nice to have the paper. It's nice to have the degree. Oh yeah. I mean, um, I I think everything that you said, um, I I think it, you know, it's important, especially for the young folks that are watching this, um, to really, to really take that in. Um, uh, you know, when we're young, we have a few things working against us. I mean, they work for us in many ways, but they also can work against us. 
One of them is hormones. <laughs> okay, so uh, we can be quick to make certain decisions uh, because things are exciting and they give us a certain kind of rush and it's very intense and we don't have a lot of perspective right. for other things that would give us that kind of that kind of intensity. Um, uh, another thing that we, uh, that, you know, <laughs> that's there is, um, so I have this sort of, uh, theory of the perception of time. So my theory of the perception of time is based on, it's not based on, uh, chronometric time. That's not the way our brain works when we process time. It's not metronomical time. It is time that is relative to the events that are occurring. And that's relative to how long we've lived. So as an infant, you know, that first year was your, that was your whole life. But by the turn you turn two, that's only half of your life, three, a third of your life, four, a fourth of your life, and so on. So what happens is, as you've experienced more things, um, uh, the sense of how fast time is passing by, it changes, you know, and so when once you've had a few more things under your belt then it's like things are slowing down and it's like okay i can see the significance of this okay i have time and i've experienced a few things that were similar to this so i know i have time right, right. you know and so yeah it makes it 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 it, it you know that um uh, the, the, the phrase wiser than your years. Now that's actually not possible. It's in a, it's a contradiction in terms, right? But what is meant by that is that, um, and usually what facilitates that is having people that are wise, people that are older than you talking to you and you being willing to listen to what it is that they're saying. Listen even more than this rush of adrenaline that you're getting, considering, you know, whatever this opportunity is or whatever is going on. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, and then, you know, young folks these days too have so many distractions, so many more than what I had. Um, you know, just consider YouTube, um, all of the music. I mean, I, I asked my, you know, I'll ask students, Hey, you know, so what, what are you into? Like, what are you listening to? You know, I've got incoming freshmen and I'll be asking them these questions and say, Oh yeah, I love, you know, everything, man. I, I, I just love everything. Okay. All right. Um, do you listen to jazz? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Who, who do you listen to? Oh, well, you know, uh, I like Dexter Gordon and I like, uh, Sonny Rollins, you know, okay. Name me a record. <laughs> right. Well, um, okay. Well, name me the name of a tune. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, you know, cause <laughs> you, I think what happens is because there's so much stuff out there, it makes it, it makes it much more likely that people will be very surface level about a lot of stuff, yeah. but not deep in anything in particular. Now, let me, let me ask you, what, what are some things that you have done to try to counteract that in yourself, in your own playing? Well, I would say I, I kind of grew up in an interesting uh, interesting time being a baby in of the nineties in that, you know, I remember when there was no internet, I remember when, you know, dial up AOL 
was a thing. I remember when there were no cell phones. I remember when there was a car phone. I remember when there was a flip phone, you know, so I don't have the perspective of my teachers who say, oh yeah, I listened to the same five records vinyl so much. You know, I spun the records back to listen to every note of the Stanley Turrentine solo so many times that I like graded the record into the ground. And I could sing along with every piano solo, every trumpet solo, every saxophone solo, every bass solo, because I only had five records. And that's what I listened to backwards and forwards, you know, every which way. So I was kind of in the in between because I was growing up at a time when Napster happened and LimeWire happened and yep. Kazaa and yep. BearShare and YouTube. And so, yep. you know, this explosion of access to, you know, the entire scope of music and, and just information in general, um, I was starting my journey prior to that and then diving into my journey, obviously, during that time. So I started some of the habits young where you know i was that person that listened to the cds that were in my dad's car that listened to the records that were in my grandma's house and you know those were the things that i wore out ad nauseum a thousand times in a row and i could tell you every song from you know uh, doing all right dexter gordon freddie hubbard album i could sing every note of dexter and freddie and i could also tell you the exact track listing of the austin powers spy who shagged me theme to the movie soundtrack because that was one of the other cds that was just in the car all the time so Mm. like that's what i had and that's the stuff that i wore out so i had kind of developed those muscles that come from you know listening to a recording and listening to it a hundred times, focusing on the drums, listen to it a hundred times, focusing on the bass, listening to it a hundred times, focusing on the solo, right? So that I had already kind of established those skills that when, you know, Pandora's box opened and now I could go on, you know, Apple Music or iTunes, or I could go on YouTube and find any song I wanted, I kind of still knew the way the proper way to digest the music, you know, because I, I think that was a big thing for me when I got to school and sat around and started listening to records with friends is that when I was growing up, mm. a lot of the times I just fast forwarded to the trumpet solo and I just transcribed the trumpet solo. And then I would sit around with all my friends in jazz school and we would listen to records and they would, they would stop it and rewind and say, man, did you, did you hear that Phil Roy Haynes just played? Like run that back. Did you hear that thing? Like, Oh my God, did you hear that Phil that, you know, Tony played and Herbie played that chord and that made Wayne go off and do that. And it kind of opened up, you know, listening to jazz music for me because, you know, it's really not a passive experience. You really have to be an active listener And it's the kind of thing where you can listen to a track five times in a row and zero in on a different member of the band each time. And you're going to get something completely different out of it. And I think that kind of really focused listening maybe gets lost when, you know, you're scrolling TikTok and the next thing comes up and the next thing comes up up, or you're just on YouTube and one minute you're watching Snarky Puppy. Then it's a grainy footage of a live concert from like Stockholm 66, second quintet. Then all of a sudden it's, you know, like the next thing that, you know, and it's just, it's like you said, if, if you have everything at your fingertips, naturally, it's going to be a little bit more of a, of a glazed overview. You're not really diving in. And I think the study of jazz music, you know, if you really are a student of the music, you have to give each kind of style, each era, each decade really requires your full attention to kind of assimilate that language into your playing. And if you're serious about playing jazz music, you have to know just as much repertoire and be able to play in the style of the 20s and the 30s as play in the 40s and 50s with bebop as play hard bop and be able to hang on Wayne tunes and monk tunes from the fifties and and sixties and so on and so forth. So what I see with younger students now is like people that are just kind of, like you said, they're, they're, they're a little bit in on all these different things, but kind of the deep dive hasn't happened, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, (laughs) there's an issue 
uh, so so the the sort of surface level sort of um, altitude or you know wh- however you want to describe that part of that is because there's less skin in the game right? right so in the past if you wanted to get a recording you had to pay for it right you had to and then you couldn't own everything because you know that i mean even if you had you know a warehouse i mean you'd still run out of space at some point yeah yeah, yeah. right um uh and <clears throat> And then the stuff like you were talking about, listening to something over and over and over, that was a natural, uh, 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 that was organic to not having as many recordings. Okay. So you have that going on. And then once you've developed that muscle, uh, that sort of approach to learning stuff, spending a lot of time with it, listening to it differently, uh, to try to access different instruments, um, an approach that I've, I've taken to becoming a better composer and arranger for certain instruments is by learning that instrument, mm. you know? So my first, my first instrument, saxophone, alto saxophone, um, and then, you know, flute, clarinet, and then, some crappy piano that I didn't really yeah. pay attention to until after I finished my master's degree. And then, um, bass guitar and serious about piano, like playing a lot more piano. Right. So what happened was as I sort of really got intense about each one of those things, when I would listen to recordings, they all sounded different. You know, so recordings that I'd heard for years and years and years, miles, like milestones. I listen to that record now, now actually understanding what the bass player is actually doing. Mm. It's just a different record, you know, and it also obviously makes you better writer um, and understand certain, you know, uh, ergonomics and, you know, what's idiomatic to the instrument and all that kind of stuff. And... You know, there's nothing more uh, active as far as listening than transcribing, right? Totally. But not just transcribing solos, transcribing entire pieces of music. You know, everything, transcribing the entire thing. You know, I've, you know, transcribed, you know, orchestration, you know, uh, dense orchestration. Um, and, And a lot of that first starts out by deciding what the instrumentation is. Like, how many string parts are there? What what are the string players? And figuring out all that kind of stuff. And that stuff you can take as far as you want to take it. But if that's never been part of this sort of process, but then then but then also, even before you're born, all of the music in world history is available for free on YouTube. This, it's not likely that you're going to go backwards right. to do that, to take that effort. Absolutely. Uh, and that's why I think folks, um, your age, you're about like on the, you're, you're like kind of like right on the fence almost, but your age and older, I think can appreciate that. And I think can fully take advantage of having access of all this music, right? Because w- I think you'll still respect the music, you know? Um, whereas I think it's very hard for folks, um, you know, say in their twenties, <laughs> mid twenties and younger, right. it's very hard for them. I think to have the same kind of, uh, viewpoint. I, I think, I think you can teach them how to do it. If they have a good teacher, or a good mentor, they can be taught to respect it. But I think the default is to just, you know, hey, this is here. I don't have to work for it. Right. You know, matter of fact, everything's already been transcribed. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it, it can turn into that. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so 
so what kind of stuff do you practice, man? You know, I, I have been working at a, you know, from a place of deficiency for so long on the horn, uh, physically, technically, um, that, you know, I think they say uh, there's some adage in there for, for artists or athletes or anyone that is really honing a craft. You know, they say um, that you should be working on your weaknesses, right? And wanting to get your weaknesses to the level of where your strengths are. And for me, you know, my particular, uh, you know, lot in life was that I was born with certain innate things, you know, gifts or whatever you want to say, talent that came very naturally to me in, in some ways. So a lot of things that pertain to the skills as an improviser, such as, you know, uh, having a, 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 a good sense of melody, um, having a good ear. I don't have perfect pitch, but I have really good relative pitch, which arguably benefits me even more because I'm not married to hearing something in the key it's in. I can actually transpose it and figure it out for myself in a different key. I've never had to practice like, things in all 12 keys in the ways that other people have. I just can hear it and can do it. Um, I never really had to put on a metronome and shed, you know, up tempo. Like I just was always able to hear shit and make it happen at a, at a fast tempo. And I'm kind of rattling off all of these kind of improvisatory skills and saying how great I am naturally at all of them. It sounds obnoxious, but the, the opposite end of the spectrum is physically on the trumpet, I have to work 10 times harder than the average guy to, to get the same amount of facility. So, you know, I basically was like living in this mind prison as an 18 year old where I was transcribing solos of Freddie Hubbard's and Woody Shaw and Winton and miles that were like the total apex of sophistication of harmony and, and also technique on the instrument. But I was struggling so hard to play out of the staff, you know, I mean, the, the trumpet has always been really fickle for me. And um, in a way, I, I would almost, I wouldn't have it any other way because it forced me to, to develop good habits and to be disciplined because the only way that I was going to get halfway decent at playing the horn was if I practiced three, four, five, six hours a day. That's it. There's, there's no shortcut. I have to do the same exercises over and over again every day for years in order to get this much better. And because I love the music, you know, I'm, I'm down, I'm down for the cause, like sign me up, you know, I'll go to get my shovel and just go out there and, and dig another hole every day. And, mm -hmm. and that's really what I've been focusing on pretty much. You know, when I was working with Sean before college, we would do hour lessons. Half of it would be jazz. Half would be classical pedagogy. So for every Lee Morgan solo I was transcribing, I was also learning a new, you know, etude or articulation exercise, what have you. And when I got to college, I made the decision to study with Laurie Frank, who, as I mentioned prior, was a classical player, was not a jazz player. And I just, I was here as an improviser and I was here on my instrument and I had to find a way to get them here in order to be a proficient professional. And that's been my journey, you know, for the last... 12 years since I was a freshman in college is like, <coughs> if I have time to practice, it's going to be technical studies. It's going to be physical. It's going to be developing the musculature to support the next highest note to get me through the last tune at the third set at the end of a big band gig, you know, all of these kind of things related to my facility on the instrument. Now that would only works because I am also simultaneously performing so much so I feel like a lot of my jazz growth comes from the bandstand. So I'm not necessarily mm. shedding with play alongs. I'm not necessarily shedding, you know, diminished licks in all 12 keys, but I'm out at a jam session or a gig every night playing tunes, learning new tunes, interacting with rhythm sections, you know, and, and my, my jazz playing has developed in those 12 years. And I have added new wrinkles and I have evolved and my tastes and aesthetics have changed. So the, the, the practicing of jazz for me mostly occurs on the bandstand. And when I have time to practice, I'm just like maniacally obsessed. I mean, you're, you're a bodybuilder. So, you know, you know, you have multiple disciplines where you know how important that regimen and that routine is. And actually when you were talking about the routine that 
you, you know, the little regimen you put yourself through before you go to bed at night, that reminded me of as musicians, why we have a warm up routine that, you know, we spend mm -hmm. five, 10, 15, 20 minutes on. And it's not because, you know, if you brush your teeth and then wash your face and then put on your pajamas, you're going to sleep miraculously, but it's because our bodies are, you know, they like that, you know, routine, they can kind of set their watch by these sort of cycles and patterns that they recognize. So, you know, I've always had a warm up routine that I'll do the same thing every day. And I really do think physically, you know, working on your technique on an instrument actually is the same as like being an athlete and, and, you know, working out your body and, I'm a huge sports buff and I love fitness and playing sports and working out. And to me, the same discipline of running five miles every day, or, you know, trying to add an extra rep to my max weight is the same discipline it takes to do your lip slurs every day and to do your long tones. And if you're a saxophone player, you know, spending the time to work on flute and clarinet so you can actually get a sound out of them, you know, that, that kind of discipline applies you know, in kind of different facets of life. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's something very uh, spiritual, you know. Absolutely. I, I say, you know, I, <clears throat> so uh, it's not spiritual without ritual, right? It's a play on words, right? So ritual right. is part of spiritual, right? So um, often is the case that, we think of spiritual as being something that is a uh, sort of uh, amorphous, uh, totally randomized. Um, and, and often it is the case that we think of uh, spontaneity as being some sort of random collection of, of, of things, but that's actually not how sp uh, spontaneity works. Sp Spontaneity relies on the structure. Spontaneity is increased with an increased knowledge of the structure. I follow. If I pull, if I play, if I say improvise in F major, only can play notes of the F major scale. Okay, I'm getting around. I'm getting around. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm so free. I'm liberated. Okay, do that in F sharp. <laughs> okay so go, the reason is it's not because f is a magic key and f sharp is not it's because you're less familiar in f sharp right and so that less familiarity means that you're less spontaneous right you know um uh you must prepare for spontaneity I, and it totally I like sound, that. I like that. It, I, it sounds totally ridiculous at, at first thought, but but no, actually, it is the case that all of these rituals and these patterns that we engage in, the purpose of them is to facilitate. See, as as you automate these processes, it means that you're using less bandwidth and then more of the bandwidth with can be actually used to actually the creative process the actually producing new information you know so yeah so it's a <laughs> so so let me let me ask you uh what are your big goals like uh, like if you if you could have your dream come true. Um, I mean, in, in, in maybe down the road, sure. 20 years from now, 30 years from now, how do you, how do you see your future? You know, I've always uh, thought of different artists and musicians and, and entertainers that I kind of would want to emulate their success or their path. And it's funny because most of the times if I'm doing an interview or a podcast or any, you know, someone emails me questions, it always comes up where they're like, are you a trumpet player first? Or are you a singer first? Or are you a singer that plays trumpet or a trumpet player that sings or whatever? 
And I always look at those two things as, as one, you know, married together voice. You know, I scat mm. the same phrases that I play on the horn, you know, much in the way that if you listen to Louis Armstrong or Clark Terry or Chet Baker, of course, you know, Dizzy, all these guys that would scat and play Roy Eldridge. It's, it's, it really, it's, it's coming from the same source. Right. So I don't look at myself as one or the other. I think, you know, someone asked me, are you a trumpet player or a singer? And I just say, yes, you know, um, but the one time that there is sort of a, a disconnect, you know, or, or a Jekyll and Hyde is when I think about what path I see for myself, because on one hand, <coughs> I look at someone like Harry Connick Jr. And I think that's my North star, right? Harry Connick Jr., incredibly talented musician, writes all of the charts, arranges for his own big band, toured the world, sold out Madison Square Garden as a jazz recording artist, major record deal, parlayed that into acting, film and television, you know, recurring role on Will and Grace, Broadway, movie star, judge of American Idol, parlayed that into daytime TV talk show host, you know, so now he's showing you how to make, uh, you know, Halloween costumes out of things in your closet. And then on the commercial break, he's going in the audience and he's singing Lush Life to some housewife that's like swooning. You know, it just kind of this total package of like entertainer. But there is so much substance there musically. Um, and that does not get diluted by this person being a great entertainer and personality. Um and so I say, hey, I would love to be Michael Buble. I would love to be Harry Connick Jr. I would love to be Chris Bodie, right? So I, I do have aspirations that are as large as an arena, you know? But at the same time, if I think of my aspirations as a trumpet player, it comes back to like, oh man, I just, I want to play with Horace Silver's band. Oh, I want to play with Blakey's band. Or I look at someone like Sean, or I look at someone like Terrell Stafford, you know, and I say, oh, my gosh, these guys are living the dream, you know, like they're touring the world. They have a record deal. They have their own band They're playing in a quintet, you know, or they have a great they have a great teaching gig and they're, you know, working with young people and inspiring generation. And then they can still go out and tour the world and play whenever they want. And so I kind of have these two paths where I was like, man, if I end up like, you know, Tom Harrell or something like that would be awesome. But then I'm also like, oh, man, but if I end up like Harry Connick Jr., that would be awesome, too. And so I really I, there is some internal conflict there where, like, I don't really know which path is going to illuminate itself, but I'm kind of open to all possibilities, you know. So I'm not like really selling out super hard on like the crooner kind of aesthetic, you know, but a show of mine is always going to have an element of that. And it's not always just going to be here are the eight post bop, hard bop tunes that I wrote. And here's me taking a trumpet solo without any talking in between songs, you know, like that's not going to be my aesthetic either. So I kind of exist in this limbo somewhere between like, I can do like a cabaret cruise ship, but then I can also play at smalls playing the music of Wayne and Herbie and feel comfortable in both of those settings. So um, you would think that that is a blessing and in many ways it is, but when it comes to questions like this, where I ponder my future, I do, even at 30 years old, even after recording two records and, and feeling like artistically I'm finding my own voice, I still very much feel like I could veer off wildly in this direction or that direction in the next 10 years. And one path is just as viable as the other. And I don't really know. I don't really know where the, where the road is going to lead, but I do know that I'll be playing the horn and, and, and singing and trying to inspire young people. Um, however that looks, you know, and as long as I have a gig, and as long as I have, you know, a place to show up and play and a roof over my head, then I'm, I'm not going to obsess too much about, you know, where the path leads. Yeah, I mean, it's like you, you're you uh, you're taking two cats gigs. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, uh, you're, you're taking all the singers gigs and all the <laughs> horn players gigs. Uh, plus, you're taking all of the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what's happening, man. I mean, I um it's it's interesting. I mean, I you know, I 
play i i play a lot of instruments whatever sure I, but it's but it's it's all been um to work you know i i, I want to be around music and so i've developed skills to be able to do the kinds of right. things that i want to do and you know everything in my life has been facilitated by music um even this interview series and um uh you know, every you know, nobody care would care what I had to had to say if it wasn't for music. <laughs> you know, and so it's been a, a incredibly uh, sort of rewarding pursuit music. But that's not the only thing that I'm interested in. <laughs> and so I don't know what the future is going to be, but I know music is going to be in it. Mm hmm. And sometimes that's all you need. Yeah, man, that's 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 my wavelength right now. I'm 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 on that. I'm on that wavelength myself, especially yeah. now, because we're living in such uncertain times, you know, that the next gig is not necessarily guaranteed. So it definitely, uh, you know, this summer of kind of being busy, you know, I just went to see my buddies. Emmett, speaking of Emmett and Russell, they were playing at Lincoln Center last night, uh, this weekend with Herlin Riley, the master drummer. And they had just opened Jazz Lincoln Center this weekend after 17 months of being closed. They opened and I was in that room and, you know, they were 100 percent occupancy and it was vaccination proof. So people, you know, sitting there on the bandstand, they had masks off. And I was really trying to just kind of like take that moment in. And, and, and let that sink in what that felt like, how, how, you know, almost normal it did feel and just not take it for granted, you know, because this, this whole thing has proven to be so uh, unpredictable and, you know, it's, it almost seems like a, like a, like a futile exercise to try and imagine where the path is going to go right now. You know, you kind of just have to be able to, like you said, just, just take care of the music and trust that the music will take care of you, you know? And on that note, <laughs> it's been great having you. And um, if there, do you have anything that you want to plug? You know, I, I think in general I covered it. I mean, I did put out an album right before the pandemic called A Lot of Living to Do. And I have a Christmas record coming out. I, you know, this is airing here in the dog days of summer. But uh, right around the corner will be Christmas time. And I'm working on the artwork and the track listing on this thing right now. So it, it'll be coming out for the holidays. It's a big band record with the Stephen Feifke big band, a frequent collaborator of mine, one of my good buddies, an old roommate. So uh, that's the next project I have coming out. And that'll be around the holidays. And, uh, you know, my website's Benny Benack Jazz, and I put all the gigs up there. So catch me if you can. Beautiful. All right, man. Well, God bless you. Be well. All right. Thank you. Dr. Thunder, always a pr pr pleasure and a privilege. All right, man. Good night.